This is a four core, eight thread processor, and this is a four core, eight thread processor. The big difference though, is that they came out roughly 10 years apart. And when it comes to things like home labbing, gaming, and productivity, does that even matter? Well, yeah, duh, but how much? Let's find out. So our two contenders today are the modern day 14th gen Intel i3 14100 released in 2024 and the Xeon E5 2623V3 from 2014. You can browse through their ARC pages to compare every little detail between them, but I've condensed them down into these main items. As we've already discussed, they're both four core, eight thread processors, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. The older Xeon has a base clock of three gigahertz and can boost up to 3.5, which is pretty respectable for a Xeon from 10 years ago. The i3 flexes its muscles here though with a base clock of 3.5 and can boost up to 4.7. TDP isn't a super accurate measurement of power efficiency, but it can put you in the right ballpark. The Xeon has a listed TDP of 105 watts while the i3 has two listed, one at 60 and one at 110. So like, yeah, we're gonna have to do some real life tests here. For RAM, they both actually support DDR4, but the i3 also supports DDR5 and the Xeon gets ECC. Kind of makes you realize how long we've been on DDR4. Impressive. Now for the PCIe version, while the Xeon is rocking version three, we do get 40 lanes. The i3 gets the faster version four and actually five as well, but only gets 20 lanes. This will play a factor if you're looking at multiple PCIe cards. The last thing is something that could play a huge factor depending on your use case and that's built-in graphics. The Xeon has none, while the i3 gets a UHD 730 with QuickSync for hardware transcoding. And the most important thing, price. I snagged the Xeon for $14 from Newegg Marketplace, and the i3 costs nearly 10 times that from Amazon at 135 bucks. So yeah, that's how these stack up on paper, but that's boring. Let's see how they perform in the real world. Wait, what's this? This video is sponsored by Ugreen and their line of RevoDock products. Their RevoDock Pro 313 is a 13 in one docking solution that will add plenty of expandability to your USB C enabled device, like three additional displays at 4K 60 Hz, 10 gigabit per second file transfer via USB Type C or A, 100 watt charging, full 1 gigabit Ethernet. 3.5 millimeter audio and SDTF card slots. Wanna see something funny? I have two laptops and they have a combined zero USB type A ports and zero ethernet ports. So this is a must carry in my laptop bag. If 13 ports is too many for you, I get it. 13 is a pretty big number. But don't worry, Ugreen has you covered with various options in the Revo Dock line from a five port solution all the way up to the 13, with plenty of options in between, all offering plenty of expandability and those juicy USB type A ports. Check out the entire Revo Dock lineup using the link down in the description below. I tried to get these builds as close as possible for the most part, so they're both using a one terabyte Samsung Pro NVMe drive, adequate cooling, PSU, and the same AMD RX 6700 XT GPU. Obviously, they require different motherboards, so the Xeon is chilling in a Chinese X99 board from eBay, that was like $50, and the i3 has a more modern B660 board from ASRock. I don't expect these boards to play a noticeable factor for performance though. Look man, I know it's not a perfect comparison, but it's close enough. If you don't like it, then hit up Gamers Nexus and maybe he'll do like an eight part mini series on me. Okay, so for these builds, I've broken it down into two use cases. You're either building a system to run a desktop environment like Windows and do some desktop stuff like office work, gaming, or productivity, or you're looking to build out a home server and do some virtualization. Let's take a look at how these systems stack up running Windows. We are running Windows 11 on the 14100 and Windows 10 on the Xeon since Windows 11 isn't supported on it. The first thing I want to test is power draw when just having the system idle at the desktop. The Xeon system was drawing just 10 watts from the CPU and 62 watts from the wall, while the newer 14100 was using just five watts from the CPU and 45 watts from the wall. That's a pretty significant difference, I'd have to say. You can also tell that this is where my cat likes to lay due to the hair. 
When just browsing the web or watching YouTube videos, those numbers increase just slightly and surprisingly not much from the older Xeon system. Both of these provided smooth desktop experiences and I would have no complaints about using either of them. But I don't think anyone really cares about how these run YouTube. Let's drag race them in Cinebench R23. In a multi-core run on the Xeon, we saw the CPU draw 60 watts and give us a score of 3598, which is not impressive at all, but what did you expect? What about the 14100? Well, during the same test, we pulled about 10 watts more with 71 watts from the CPU and ended with a score of 7,979. Still not fantastic for a modern processor, but it's more than double of the Xeon while being literally the lowest tier chip in the current Intel Core lineup. For single core, the Xeon gave us a laughable 662 and the 14100 a respectable 1640. These numbers aren't indicative of real world results, like you're not just going to get double the performance in everything going from the Xeon to the 14100. So why don't we take a look at some gaming? Brett, who's actually going to be gaming on a 10 year old Xeon? Dude. I don't know, somebody who cares, just watch the video. Remember, we are using an RX 6700 XT GPU in here because obviously you're gonna wanna run a GPU for both of these systems if you wanna play something other than Minesweeper. Or in the Xeon's case, have video output at all. I first ran TimeSpy to see what it thought of my two systems and according to TimeSpy, we should see a pretty significant difference in gaming. In CSGO, at 1080p high settings, the Xeon gave us a respectable 75 FPS at 78% CPU utilization while drawing 43 watts from the CPU and 160 watts from the wall. In a vacuum, that's not bad. Over 60 FPS at 1080p high while only using 160 watts. Let's check out the 14100. We got 148 FPS with 52% utilization while pulling 37 watts from the CPU and 184 watts from the wall you're not just gonna get double the performance in everything going from the Xeon to the 14100. Okay, so in this use case, you actually are getting double the performance. I think it's due to the much higher clock speeds and increased IPCs of the newer chip on a game that's not super GPU intensive. Let's step up to something a bit harder to run in the Witcher 3. I'm just gonna put up all the power numbers over here somewhere because I don't really feel like reading through all that. At 1080p high, the Xeon gave us 97 FPS and the 14100 146 FPS. Again, a significant increase in performance while using the same GPU, this time while using roughly the same amount of power. Okay, but what about something that's really tough like Cyberpunk? 1080p medium, the Xeon came in with 46 FPS while the 14100 with 92, quite literally exactly double. Shit. Although this time we did see a significant increase in power draw. So yeah, in gaming, I think there were two takeaways. Xeon is still surprisingly usable after 10 years, even on a modern title. Although we did see some graphical surprises sometimes. The other is that you're leaving a massive amount of performance on the table by not running something more modern. I then wanted to test how these systems would handle some video transcoding workflows like editing. My software of choice here is DaVinci Resolve, so I installed that on the Xeon system and uh, no dice. The GPU wouldn't get detected even though I had the latest drivers installed. So I don't know if this is a Windows 10 thing or a Xeon thing or a Chinese motherboard thing, but it just wouldn't work. We compromised though and just installed Handbrake, which will give us a similar performance test. For both these systems, I won't be using the GPU at all for transcoding because that's dumb, this is a comparison between the CPUs. These tests are gonna highlight a pretty massive difference between these two chips, and that being the lack of any hardware transcoding support on the Xeon, while the 14100 gets quick sync with its integrated GPU. For my test, I'm using a nine minute 4K H.264 video and will be transcoding it down to 1080p. Xeon finished in about 12 minutes with an average FPS of 24 which is below real time, so not great. The 14100 though, also using H.264, except now with QuickSync hardware transcoding was much better. Finishing in just four minutes with an average FPS of 71. This is what you'd expect out of a modern CPU. 
Then if you want to use the newer, more efficient H.265 HEVC codec, then you can half the size on the final file and do it even faster. Pixel peepers will debate which one looks better, but I'm not going to get into that today. So while the Xeon is capable of performing software transcoding, it's not going to be something you want to rely on heavily. It's not like the 14100 is amazing or anything, but it's certainly better than the Xeon, as we'll see more obviously in a bit. I did want to run a disk benchmark here as well, because while they both have the one terabyte PCIe Gen 4 NVMe drive, the Xeon is only capable of Gen 3 speeds. Does that even matter? Well, according to the tests, yeah. Both of the systems were able to hit those expected speeds, and obviously the 14100 and its Gen 4-ness was much faster. When using this as a boot drive for Windows, are you going to notice a difference? Absolutely not. And if you say you can notice it, you're a liar. One thing I did notice though when it comes to using Windows is that on the Xeon system, while unzipping a large file, the CPU was pinned at 100% utilization. That same unzipping process on the 14100 is no real problem at all. Why that's the case, I don't know. I just do stuff on here and hit screen record. So as a desktop, I think unless you're just looking for something to browse the web and type up Radial fan fiction, you're pretty much just better off with a more modern system. I still think the Xeon is surprisingly capable 10 years later, but unless you got it for free, I'd spend roughly $150 more on the 14100 CPU motherboard combo. Did I honestly expect a different outcome? Not really. But what about as a server? This is the more common way you'd expect to see someone using an older Xeon. To give it a typical use case, I spun up Proxmox and did three things. Created a Windows VM, created a Docker VM with various services running, and created a Plex instance to have some live transcoding going. I figured with all these things happening on a four core CPU, we'd get a good feel for things. The Xeon, well, it did fine. With all this running and the CPU doing software transcoding via Plex, we were hovering around 80% CPU usage with a power draw spiking over 100 watts. Oh, and I took the GPU out of both systems when testing this. While this isn't really pushing the boundaries of what can be hosted in a home lab, like I know some of you are running dozens of VMs and too many Docker containers to count, for an entry level system, it's not bad. The 14100 obviously performed better here, barely breaking a sweat in the same test due to the QuickSync hardware transcoding. You can see just how easily it can handle a VM and Docker services here since the CPU is free from the chains of Plex. So as a server, it's going to be extremely dependent on your use case. For a simple server, Xeon is honestly fine, especially if you're not going to be transcoding. If you're looking specifically for a Plex server, then for the price, you can't really beat the 14100. Overall though, I don't think this was really a test to see which one you should pick. Obviously in 2024, don't go with a 10 year old Xeon if you're given the choice. This was just more to see how an enterprise chip from a decade ago fares against the lowest consumer level chip of today. Honestly, in head to head, it gets its cheeks clapped. But in a vacuum, it still holds its own as both a desktop system and a home server, which is admirable. What do you think about this? Are you running a fossil like this in your home lab? Let me know down in the comments. But that's all I have for you today. If you liked it, then drop a like. If you want to see more CPUs, then subscribe. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my older than 10 year old Xeon processors because I don't think you're allowed to have an account unless you're like 13 or something, but y'all are the best. And if you're still watching, you're PCI Gen 3. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.